This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode number 90, recorded on July 9th, 2010. Hi, everybody. It's Vincent Racaniello, and this is TWIV your weekly podcast all about viruses. And joining me today to talk about that, starting from the Northeast up in Western MA, is Alan Dove. Good to be here. Good to have you back again. How's everything? Oh, going okay. Staying indoors where it's cool. You have the AC on? Yeah, even here in Western Massachusetts. Actually, there was just a little blurb in the paper that apparently the governor of Massachusetts in his uh, his mansion um, does not have air conditioning. Wow. Because it's Massachusetts and whoever needs air conditioning up here. Well, here in New York City, they're finding stores for keeping their doors open because the, the cool air, you know, spills out on the sidewalk and right. get, get people to walk in. It's crazy. Also joining us from a cooler climate down in north central Florida is Rich Condit. Hello, Vincent. Good to Hello, have you Alan. back. Hello. Great to be here. Did you miss us? Uh, I did indeed, but I've been listening. You know, so I'm all up to date. I bet on Fridays at 2 p.m. you'd say, oh, I should be doing something. I yeah, what right. Is. What is it? What is it I'm missing here? Right, yeah. Well, you spend time with your grandkids, right? Uh, uh, the first of the Fridays I missed, I was with my grandkids. The second of those Fridays, I was traveling back from the virus structure and assembly meeting. Uh, we'll tap We'll tap into that for, for a future tweet. It, gr- it was a great meeting. And our other guest today, back for a second appearance on TWIV, is Eric Donaldson. Hey, Eric. Hi, everybody. Good to it's have you to be back. back. Yeah. yeah, it's good to be back. Eric Donaldson is at the University of North Carolina, and he is now a research assistant professor. Congratulations on that. Thank you. You were a postdoc last time, right? Right. Nothing like moving up, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> more responsibility, but it's also more exciting. So, Eric, you were last on TWIV 28, which was a long time ago, sometime last year. Yeah. And uh, then subsequently, we had uh, Matt Freeman on TWIV65, who you know. You guys work together, right? Right, right. That was in January. And uh, now Eric's back to talk about what he's been doing in bats. So that should be interesting. Um, Before we go into that, I just wanted to point out where Dixon de Pommier is. Yeah, He's been absent for a while. I actually talked to him yesterday. He called me from Bozeman, Montana. Ah, oh, my old stunt grounds. He's fishing, and actually, you can, you can uh, call people from Bozeman, Montana. <laughs> <laughs> it was a really bad connection, but uh, <laughs> he sent me a uh, a picture of a trout that he had just caught and released, which we'll we'll post on Twiv, and you guys probably can look at it because I put a link in the show notes. And he's been fishing, but before he was in Montana, he was at a place called Singularity University. Anybody heard of that? Wasn't this formerly known as Black Hole College? <laughs> that I haven't heard. <laughs> the Singularity. Um, apparently, this is a very exclusive, expensive university where they have short courses for important and powerful and wealthy people. How, how did Dick end up there? Yeah, it's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was teaching uh, about um, vertical farming, I believe. He said some people pay twenty-five grand for... I think nine weeks or something like that. To wow. There. Wow. Anyway, Ray Kurzweil is one of the founders who's a, I think he's the guy who, I'm going to get hell for this from all the IT people listening, right? He's the guy who decided there would be a singularity one day. Oh, that. You know about that, Alan? I've, I've certainly heard about it. Yeah. Ray Kurzweil, an American futurist and inventor. Yes, we both ended up on the same Wikipedia page. He's the author of several books on technological singularity, which is when computers get to be sentient. Is that right, basically? Right. I think that's the idea, is when computers reach the point where they're uh, capable of of thinking like humans. So I think he founded uh, Singularity University. And this man was born in Queens, New York. I wonder if this is related. I have a computer programmer friend who's placed himself on the longevity diet. Because he believes that within the next 
50 years or so, he'll be able to upload his brain onto a computer. Mm-hmm. So. <laughs> <laughs> now, interestingly, I noticed Kurzweil has also worked on optical character rec- recognition and text-to-speech synthesis. Mm-hmm. So I'm wondering if either of those will be working properly before we get to the singularity <laughs> thing. <Yeah. laughs> oh, you don't think they're perfect? Uh, yeah, yeah. Don't answer. <laughs> you don't have to answer. Anyway, so Dixon gave a gave a couple of lectures there, so we'll put a link to Singularity University. Maybe they'll post his uh, videos, but it's an interesting idea. They have some scientists there, but um, no one, no one that I recognized. But they ought to get some virology. Sure. So back to Eric and the bats. So Eric, uh, the last time we talked to you, actually, we talked about SARS, not bats, really. Right. Right. And since then, you've been trapping bats and sequencing what's in them so let's talk about what that what have you been up to and you know matt gave us an intro to this but you can review exactly what you're doing out there okay well we hooked up with um dr ed gates out at the university of uh, actually it's university of maryland appalachian labs in frostburg maryland and um, he's a bat ecologist who's been uh, conducting a study of bat populations in abandoned railroad tunnels in that part of the state and um, I think originally the story is the governor of Maryland wanted to do a bat bike path that traversed the state and went clear through Maryland and up into Washington, D.C. And his plan was to refurbish these tunnels, you know, cement the insides and make them nice and smooth so bicyclists could go through. And um, Ed was studying one of these tunnels that had an endangered species living in it. So he was uh, instrumental in uh studying the population and, and identify it as one of the largest hibernacula for the eastern small-footed myotis, which is endangered in the state of Maryland. So he specializes in making powerful enemies. Yes, he does, <laughs> with the governor. Um, so he's, he's had a long history um, monitoring the bat populations in these different tunnels. And so, um, you know, it, I'm in a lab that studies coronaviruses, and SARS is, you know, the most famous coronavirus of them all, you know, when it was found in the horseshoe bat, that opened all kinds of avenues for investigations into different bat species looking for coronaviruses. And so we, we be kind of were interested in doing that as well, but also applying high throughput sequencing methodology to look for viruses in uh, unique samples, possibly reservoir species, uh, was something that was interesting too. So Matt and I uh, got together with Ed and we came up with a plan to write one of the two year ARRA grants to do an investigation into uh, fecal samples from bats to see what kind of viruses we might find there. And Ed had the perfect setup. He had three tunnels in, um, in uh, Frost, near Frostburg, Maryland, where we could actually go in. He had crews that were already sampling them. They were already, you know, d- uh, doing a number of things with the bats as far as, like, the endangered species. They were already banding those. Um, they had the technology to... Uh, do well. They could weigh the bats, determine sex, determine age, all these sort of um, interesting parameters that we could use in our study to see if we could find out how viruses segregate in a population. And and what I think is the most coolest thing about this tunnel is there's seven to ten different bat species that cohabitate together in, inside the tunnel. And so there's the opportunity for viruses trafficking between different species within a, a, a micro environment, if you will. Mm. And so this was. You know, just a fascinating, you know, we we became very excited just putting the grant together. And when it got funded, we were ready to do backflips down the hallway. And uh, how, close to, how close together are these tunnels? So the main tunnel that we're dealing with is called Indigo Tunnel. And it's, I believe they're all within about two miles of each other on the same stretch of railroad okay. that goes right along the Potomac River. So do you know if the bats visit each other's tunnels? Yes, the, they, they do know that because they ban some of them and they can detect where they capture them. And sometimes they capture them at different tunnels. Some of the same, okay. same bats at different tunnels. So. Now, when uh, presumably the bats started nesting there when the trains stopped running through these tunnels, do you have a, a fix on how long they've been nesting there? Oh, yeah. So the tunnels haven't been used since 1976. And so for at least 35 years, the bats have been there. And they may have been there while the trains were going through as well. Hmm. How much, to- so how many... Sampling um, expeditions have you done to the tunnels? Um, so they they go out frequently, um, yeah. and you know three times a week over the course of the summer. Ah. Um, I've gone up a couple times, and I've got to tell you, it's been the most fun experience of my science career. Going out with the bat crew, 
Um, setting up, so the, I'll just give you a run through of what we do to, to, to trap the bats. So we basically carry all the equipment up the hill. There's a nice road just below the tunnel. So we just have like a hundred yards up the hill. Um, and we set up harp traps in front of the tunnel, which is basically, it looks just like a harp. With uh, It's almost like fishing line that runs um, vertical in front of the opening of the tunnel. And the idea is that the bat cannot detect the strings. And so it comes, when they enter or exit the tunnel, they hit the line. And when they hit the line, they drop right down into a plastic pouch. And then you can go down with your gloved hand and, and grab the bat, um, put it in a paper sack. We hold them in a paper sack for 10 to 15 minutes to allow them to pr produce a fresh fecal sample. And then we process the bats. Yeah. That's exactly usually, what I do. It's, yeah. It's usually easy to get fecal samples from animals, isn't it? Yes. It, yeah, it pretty, pretty much is. I, one of my favorite stories, though, when we were working through the details of how we were going to do the sampling, I, I asked Ed, I said, Ed, we'd like to take oral swabs as well. Do you think it'd be possible to get oral swabs from these bats? He goes, oh, yeah, they pretty much have their mouth open the whole time. So, <laughs> that's been true. <laughs> So you took some some oral so, swabs as well, yeah. yeah? Huh? Yep. So we took tissue samples, we took oral swabs, we've uh, uh, fecal samples, urine samples in some cases if they produce urine, mm -hmm. and uh, we've also collected some interesting things off the bats themselves, like uh, ticks and mites and uh, a variety of ectoparasites. So we have a great picture of you from Twiv. I think 28, is it? Picture of you with your hand in a bag. <laughs> you have these big eyes. <laughs> <laughs> that that was my very first experience, sticking my hand in the bag to, to retrieve one of the bats. So le I've got a leather glove on. I've got two latex gloves on top of that. I stick my hand in the bag. The bats are small. Their mouth probably wouldn't be big enough to get around my finger anyway. But they still have such a powerful grip on with, with their jaws that it tat attached itself to one of my fingers. And I was like, Oh no, it's going to go right through the leather glove. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's what the look on the face is there. Yeah. Your, but, uh, uh, your colleague there, I, I forgot her name. Um, Amy, right? Yeah. Amy, she's yeah. got her hands up like she's ready to rescue you. Cause she's yeah. not quite sure <laughs> what's going on. That yep. must've been fun. So you did a couple of trips just to experience what it was like, basically. Yeah. Just to go out there and experience what it's like and, uh, and to learn. I, I, th I think that's really important. I mean, just going out there and realizing what the crew's doing and what, how they're processing the bats has helped so much in understanding, you know, what's going on. So when but, I'm writing grants. What I think is cool. You've got a Twitter account. Viral nerd is your handle. And I, I picked a couple of tweets. One of them, was out late sampling bats again. Bats are the coolest creatures, capturing only adult males as females are presently in maternity roosts. Yeah. So that's 526 a.m. on May 6th. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that's the last time I was out. Um, yeah, they. you know, that's what's impressed me, too, is that I really knew nothing about bats when I started this. You know, I go out there. In fact, I had proposed to take anal swabs as well, you know, mm -hmm. and... These bats are so small that there's just no way to, to safely do that without damaging the bat. Mm. But I go out there, and these creatures are absolutely beautiful. I mean, they're just stunning in their beauty. And just holding them in your hand and, uh, you know, measuring their wings and their forearms and just seeing, the, hearing the noises that they make, um, it's just incredible. I, I mean, I was just totally blown away. Well, not everybody gets to do that, right? Yeah, exactly. And don't so, try this at home, kids. No. Yes, exactly. Right. And I should mention that, you know, everybody that handles the bats is required to have the rabies vaccine ahead of time. So Are bats protected? Um, some bats are. So the eastern uh, small-footed uh, myotis that stayed endangered mm -hmm. uh, are protected. And, you ha and we had to get permission from the Park Service to actually do the sampling there. Ed did. Okay. Uh, and there are others like the Indiana myotis, which is endangered um, in the United States. It's protected as well. Now, are you also taking, uh, do you take blood samples or DNA samples from these bats? Yes, we take tissue samples for DNA purposes. Okay. Um, we're, we're trying to get authorization to do serum samples as well. So, and can you work out family relationships among them? Um, presumably, but we've had a hard time. So, we just take a very small, uh, I think it's a two millimeter circle of the bat tissue, and we've had a really difficult time getting any useful DNA out of those samples. So we're in the process of troubleshooting that. Uh, uh, we may have to go to some other tissue route to, to get those samples. But Is this like from an ear or something? Just from the wing itself. Oh, from the wing. Oh, right. Yep. 
Yep. Okay, that makes sense. Yep. So you you made a couple of other tweets about white nose syndrome. You said we're scoring bat wings to assess white nose syndrome. Last night we saw two big browns with badly scarred wings. And then you said white nose is in this county but has not been observed in the tunnels. I hope it's not present here. If it is, I hope we find a virus. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so white nose syndrome is decimating bat populations, particularly in the northeast United States. And uh, it's a it's a disease that really is unknown. I mean, there's some uh, some indication that it may be a fungus that's causing it, a geomyces species of fungus. But the same species of fungus has been found in caves where bats are, are just fine. So there's not a clear correlation between the fungus and the disease. But the disease is just devastating. I mean, one of the things that it does is it, and how it got its name, white nose syndrome, is it appears that the fungus grows on the nose of the bat, causing the bat to wake up in, well, during hibernation and go out. And, and, and the more often the bat wakes up and burns energy, the more you know, likely it's not going to make it through the winter. It's not going to have the energy stored to make it through winter. And so a lot of bats end up starving to death because they're waking up every two to three days instead of every 12 days or so. Um, that's one thing. The other thing is that it seems to um, get into the, the wings and just decimate the tissue there. I mean, so the, I, I was at a conference uh, last November where a uh, Department of Health, I think it was in New York, uh, had some pictures. They had gone out in the wintertime looking at the caves where the bats were uh, infected with white nose syndrome. And leading up to the cave, it almost looked like a bat graveyard, just bones and wings, and looked like they'd gone through a meat grinder, and, and it was white nose syndrome that had caused it. And so it's really wiping out uh, populations of bat, particularly in the Northeast, and it's spreading further and further south. You can almost watch it um, as it moves and migrates further south. Have you, found, kind of have you found any virus associated with it, or you don't have enough no, data? Mm-hmm. we don't have enough data, but we, so we, as part of this study, we, we built that uh, component of that into it so that we're looking for signs mm-hmm. of white nose syndrome. And so the first year we did the sampling in 2009, we, did, we were scoring bat wings. And, and by scoring bat wings, what we're doing is we're looking at the, the membrane to see if there's any scars, tears, nicks, anything that might be irregular. And if you have an irregular uh, mm. sc- you know, two or three scars would be a one, a score of one. More, you know, two more, say four or five would be a score of two, and so on and so forth. Well, the first year we had just zero and one. Um, this year, just in the one night that I was out, we saw three bats that looked like they were two or two or greater. These these bats really looked like they had some major scarring going on. So, and we also know, you know, it was reported um, just a few months ago that uh, 20 miles away in a natural cave. Um, white nose syndrome decimated a colony of bats there. So we know that it's close. We know that some of these bats may have migrated from that cave um, and, or may interact with the bats in the tunnel. So white nose may be working its way into the tunnel. So we feel like we have a good opportunity here to maybe identify uh, if it is a virus or a different pathogen. Maybe we'll have a chance at identifying what it could be. So how many total samples did you collect and bring back to your lab for sequencing? So far, we have about 700 fecal samples. Wow. Um, <laughs> we have on, on the order of 350 or 400 oral swabs, 50 or so urine samples, um, a couple hundred tissue samples from wing, you know, the wing samples, mm-hmm. um, and uh, a few odds and ends of, uh, you know, like, like the ectoparasites that we've collected off the bats themselves. So do you pool these or get to Yeah, so... Yeah, so we, that, that was our strategy. Well, first of all, we wanted to figure out what would be the best strategy to do this. So we did a preliminary run, and that's what most of the data that I have. Um, we just uh, submitted a paper to the Journal of Virology that sort of summarizes that first preliminary run. But, but um, it's uh, – I uh, lost my train of thought there for a moment. So, But basically, we did pull the samples based on – species, age, and sex, So and, and, and sample type. So, for example, um, adult, big brown, female bat, fecal samples. And we'd pull eight of those together and uh, barcode those samples. Um, and then in the same pool, we'd do a different barcode with adult, female, um, tricolored bats, for example, or something like mm-hmm. that, so that we could get the most bang for our buck with the sequencing. Do you find any dead bats on these trips and can you or do you collect those we haven't and i'm not sure that we i'm not sure what the protocol is for collecting a dead bat right. I, i'm i'm pretty sure that 
Uh, well, I'd have to check with with Ed, who works with them more more directly. But I'm pretty sure that if you found a dead bat, he, the major concern would be rabies, and so that might be a totally different right, uh, right, okay, different procedure to follow. But we were definitely interested. I'm interested in trying to generate some bat cell lines, and and so I've I've been uh, trying to find a way. You know, the wind farms. A lot of uh, Ed has a couple of graduate students in his lab that are doing work with wind farms and bats. Apparently, the bats can't detect the propellers and will fly into them and get killed by the propeller. Or, and also, Ed was describing that, you know, the bat will be flying along and the, the thrust of the wind from the propeller will actually knock the wind out of the bat's lungs and it will die from that itself. Wow. Wow. But then they drop to the ground. And so I was wondering, that might be a great opportunity for us to, to pick up carcasses that are freshly killed for purposes of trying to establish cell lines. So you've got you've pooled these samples, and then I presume you extract RNA and convert it yep. to DNA. And then you do sequencing, right? Right. And then you right. have massive amounts of data, right? <laughs> massive amounts is is I feel like I'm sitting on a mountain of data, mining as fast as I can. <laughs> and so you're just looking at the preliminary runs that you've done. You haven't looked at the majority of the samples that you have, right? Right. That's right. Amazing. Yep. So then you take your sequences and you throw away whatever is cellular, of, in cellular origin. And right, so, so we do a couple of things to try to narrow it down so that we're just looking at viral RNA and DNA. So the, the procedure we're using, we're looking for RNA and DNA viruses. Right. But um, so we try to, to filter um, the sample so that anything smaller than, so basically only viruses would come through the filter. And then we treat with RNAs and DNAs ahead of time to hopefully remove any um, how, contaminants. Excuse me, how big is the filter? Is it 0.2 microns? No, it's 0. 0.4, 4, 0. 0.45. Okay, good. Yep. Just want to make sure the pox viruses get through. <laughs> yes, they do. <laughs> good point, but the, but the memes won't. Uh, no, probably. Well, actually, I don't know. How big is meme? Uh, 750. Yeah, we're filtering out the memes. 0. 0.75 microns, yeah. But the All cool right. thing, too, is we're just using part of the sample so we have the other archives so we can go back and yeah. look for other stuff as well. But yeah, so we filter, treat with RNAs and DNAs to try to remove any contaminating um, nucleic acids that might have come from the bat and then extract viral RNA, uh, do a nonspecific amplification using a barcode and then uh, use the barcode, then submit it to sequencing and use the barcode to segregate the pools back out so that we can do the sequence analysis for a specific pool. Mm. Neat. It's a big uh, bioinformatic chore, right? Yeah, it is. And it's, uh, but uh, you know, it, it's one of those things where it's my new hobby. <laughs> mm -hmm. I feel like Alfred Russell Wallace and Henry Bates when they went into the Amazon looking for butterflies. Mm -hmm. And when I heard that first story for the first time, I felt like, oh, that would be such an awesome adventure. But now I feel like I'm sitting on my couch with my computer mining viruses, you know, all the time in, in, in any spare moment I got. And it's so cool. I'm having the time of my life. <laughs> so, so could you tell us what you found? Yeah, let me uh, give you a run through of some of the things that um, we have found, and, and I, this is by all means preliminary because a lot of a lot of the the pools that are coming in now, I just haven't even had a chance to to go into a lot of detail looking. But probably the most impressive thing that uh, that we found. So I'll, I'll just give you some statistics on the first uh, sequencing. Um, so the, just the preliminary run, we got six hundred eleven thousand sequence reads. The, it was six pools, so we had adult. Um, let me see if I've got that. Adult, uh, male and female, big brown bats, juvenile big brown bats, some tricolored bats, some, uh, and, an, and all of those were fecal samples. And then we had one sample, uh, pool number six, which was just the oral swabs. And so, in the fecal samples, per particularly in juvenile bats, we found a variety of coronavirus hits. Um, in fact, if we got 76 reads that were coronavirus that formed 17 contigs, and when we compared these to known coronaviruses, most of these are, well, they're all group 1 coronavirus, so it's a novel group 1 coronavirus, and it's very much, um, it's closely related to another bat coronavirus called HKU2, but it's about 50 to 60 percent identity, so it's clearly unique. And in mm -hmm. fact, it almost looks like it could be ancestral to uh, human coronavirus like uh, NL63 and HK, uh, HK, which human coronavirus 229E. So it, it's a very interesting looking virus. But we got 68 
um, sequence reads, and it does, so we don't have the full length of the genome. Hmm. Um, what we have instead are little snippets that align along the replicase. We have a, a nice sized chunk of the spike. Uh, we have uh, almost a full membrane protein or a gene and a nucleocapsid gene. So we have enough information there, and, and they're all clustering in the group one cluster the alpha uh, coronaviruses, so it, it looks like a novel coronavirus, and we've, we've dubbed that the Appalachian Ridge coronavirus. So these are in every fecal sample, you said? or, or just Nope, some? this actually, as it turns out, it's one fecal sample. It's an, it's an adult, or I'm sorry, a juvenile big brown bat. Okay. Now, we've also verified, so when I get a sequence run back, the first thing I do is look to see if there are other coronaviruses. And uh, in the eastern small-footed myotis sample, there's also a group one coronavirus that looks different than this one. So it looks like there may be at least, in fact, um, there's also a virus, a coronavirus from pool three, which is um, the, the one is adult, I'm, I'm sorry, one is juvenile female big browns, one is juvenile male big browns. Both of them have a unique coronavirus that looks like it's different. Mm. So it um, looks like there's at least three novel coronaviruses in the samples and there may be a, a lot more. So that would that I, was. I would think that the profile of viruses that you get would be very strongly dependent on where you sample, whether it's oral or fecal or or whatever. Yes, and that's absolutely right. And uh, in fact, what's interesting is that, you know in pool six the oral swab was. I, I was amazed at the number of herpes-like virus hits that, mm. were, that were in the oral swab. And in fact, it looks like. Uh, we've got a nice sized chunk of a, a herpes virus. You know, it looks like it might be a novel bat cytomegalovirus. Mm. Wow. Yeah. And so, so how do you, especially with something like a fecal sample, like I remember when we talked to Eric Delwart, he, he talked about uh, finding um, insect viruses from the insects that the bats ate and finding also what plant viruses from the plants that the insects ate. So how do you decide what's really a bat virus? And, and what is from something else, in particular with something like a stool sample. Right. Yeah, and, that, and that, that's a huge problem. And I, I love that ep episode, by the way, with Eric Delworth. That I was just, I could relate to a lot of things that he was talking sure. about. Yeah, a, a lot of, and that's absolutely probably more, most of the viruses that we're seeing are insect viruses or plant viruses that are vectored by insects. So it is hard, and particularly when you're dealing with just a little snippet. You know, a lot of these, you're just getting a low copy number of, a couple of reads here and there on the genome, so it's hard to distinguish. You know, it'd be hard to tell, and that's why I think that, you know, th this this type of work is is cool and important. But I think it's it's got to lead to more of a viral discovery where you actually bring out the virus and, and begin to study it and understand right. where it might have come from. So that's right. what I'm interested in doing is right. pursuing, um, looking for the cool viruses and then determining whether or not bats are just transiently dropping them in the environment or if the virus actually has a stage of replication in the bat. Any rabies? No rabies, but we've got a novel rhabdovirus that actually, when I first came back, it was hitting to rabies. So, so basically the strategy that we use God, is... God, that'd be scary. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I can see you sitting here looking through these things. Oh! Yeah. <laughs> Well, I was so it came back rabies, but it was fifty percent identical or so. So I was like, okay, okay. it's rabies like, but rabies was the the you know for this particular read, rabies was the closest match in the non redundant database. So that was a pretty strong indication that I thought it was a Lissa virus at first, but uh, when I did built more of the contig and looked at it in comparison to other um, reference genomes, it, be, it became clear that it's a novel rhabdovirus, and it, it's somewhere between, let's see, it's snakehead. And let's see if I can find that slide here. It's somewhere between snakehead and uh, the an insect rhabdovirus. So I'm pretty sure it's probably going to be an insect virus. But so this is great. You're coming up with a lot of novel stuff. Yeah, now, yeah speaking, a lot of speaking novel of stuff. scary things that might be lurking, have you found any phylo phyloviruses? You know, that's interesting. Uh, and uh, so a, a major question is where does phylovirus? you know, end, you know, right. at what percent identity do you say it's no longer a phylovirus, it's something new? So, I, so, I, but I've got some hits that are just very distantly related to phylovirus and I'm in the process of figuring it out. But one of the, one of the caveats that I need to say here is that a lot of times you get a match to like a polymerase that is conserved across a great number of viral families and it may be most closely related to phylovirus 
but it's really something very different. So I'm hesitant to call it a filovirus at this time, but it does distantly relate to um, Ebola, Zaire, and things like that. So I'm in, I'm in the process right now of trying to figure out what that thing is, because that, of course, is very interesting. You're going to be on the news, man. I know it. I know it. I just hope, you know, that, that's been my hope that uh, we don't find something <laughs> terrifying in the tunnel and they go in with a flamethrower and kill all the bats and pave it and make the bike path the new, after all. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How about uh, pox viruses? See any of those? Well, that's interesting because there is a, um, let me see, in pool number four, which is the Myotis libii, the little brown bat, there is a, let me see if I can find it really quick here. It is a pox virus. It is um, bovine stomatitis. Does that sound right? Uh, yeah. Uh, I think that's a parapox virus. Parapox. Um, that's exactly right. Cool. Parapox. Hmm. These things yes. eat insects, right? Right. Yes. It, yes. So I have 240 sequence reads that map, map to that are most closely related to bovine papular stomatitis virus. Holy cow! From <laughs> yes. I'm oh, sorry about that. <laughs> from <laughs> from from one animal or what? This is from a pool of the little brown bat. Uh, so it's from a pool, but I mean, within the pool, you can distinguish whether they're coming from one animal or several, can't you? Right, right. Yeah, okay. we can so go in and look can at you the tell individual. me whether that particular virus is in, I mean, if it's in a pool, is it probably from one individual? Well, that's, so that's part of the, the study will be to go, then go back and find out what the I prevalence see. is in the different samples. But, okay. But yeah, it could be a number. So that's a lot of reads. Yeah, that's a lot of reads. Um, the caveat being that, you know, bovine papular stomatitis virus is its closest neighbor. That doesn't necessarily right. mean it's going to end up being. Right. I would assume that it's not the same as that. Well, that's why I asked. I mean, if it was a uh, a uh, bat that had some interaction with cows, then maybe there could be some relationship. But if these are all out just skimming insects. Right, right. No, it's probably something else. That's very interesting. Yeah. Any picornas? Yeah. So there's. So I've got some hits to human uh, uh, human enterovirus D, simian picornavirus. Mm, wow. um, some very interesting. A lot. And like I said, you know, I just feel like at this point I'm picking the virus that's most interesting at the moment. And yeah, maybe we ought to time. ask if there's any viruses you haven't found. Mm. <laughs> that might be, that might be quicker. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Um, yeah, so there, there, there's a ton of interesting viruses. Like I said, a lot of them, it looks like in the plant virus realm, there's uh, in the Timoviridae family, we've got viruses, large chunks of virus. We'll probably be able to do full-length genomes there of novel. Um, it looks like a new genus of the Timoviridae family. Uh, interestingly, insect viruses um, that are very closely related to sac brood virus of honeybees and deformed wing virus of honeybees and Israel acute paralysis virus of honeybees. Some of these Israel acute uh, paralysis virus has been associated with honeybee colony collapse. And some of these viruses are very closely related. And we're seeing in all five of the fecal sample pools, we're seeing these types of viruses. So I'm not sure. So the interesting thing is, is these all look novel. There's, it's not a, it's not close enough that you would say it's just a different strain of a known virus. But it, it, what's unclear is it is it a honeybee virus or is it an aphid virus that the bat eats? It just is closely related to the honeybee virus. So a lot of those kinds of relationships and details are yet to be worked out. But very fascinating stuff. Now you mentioned um, trying to get a, a bat cell line going. Um, are you? Is that a is that a major effort or, or just something that you're? thinking about doing at some point. Yeah, that's something we're uh, thinking about pursuing in the very short short term. Do you run into regulatory issues of one sort or another with that? Yeah, definitely. I think with, with and actually in collaboration with Matt Freeman at the University of Maryland, I believe he's got the um, IACUC approval to go ahead to get you know the samples necessary um, to, to begin trying to transform some cell lines and get them going. But uh, yeah, it is a, a paperwork nightmare. Mm-hmm. I need to ask you one more virus. Um, any mixo-type viruses, orthomixo or paramixo-like viruses? Mm, I might have to get back to you on that one. It's okay. Just wondering. Yeah. Bad uh, flu. Yeah. Bad We've flu. Now, I've seen some that look like flu. But, again, a lot of this is preliminary. And so I, I would, before I would ever go out and say that, you know, this is a, a flu-like virus that came from a bat, I'd want yeah, to do a, sure. a lot. Of, I'd have to convince myself. 
But uh, so a lot of this is when I first saw this list of viruses that came back, I was just, wow. Yeah. If if this is true, this is terrifying. And this is uh, one, a couple of caves in western Maryland, right? Right. And a few species of bats. So the possibilities are amazing when you start looking on a bigger scale. Right. Right. Wow. Now, now, all these are distantly related, so I didn't see anything that looked like it would be a, a pathogen of humans directly. Right. And so th- I think that's important to note. But uh, Now, how in a, in particular, in a grant application or to your grandmother, do you rationalize focusing on bats? Is it because they're such a common reservoir, apparently, of uh, zoonotic infections, or are there other reasons as well? Yeah. Well, there are a couple of reasons, actually. The, the, the fact that they are a reservoir for other important human pathogens is, is a major, major reason. But um, these bats um, are interesting because they, they have some so, – well, first of all, if you look on the – this is controversial, but if you look on the tree of life, bats are more closely related to humans than our rodents or other carnivores. So theoretically, any orthologous uh, proteins that may be used as, re- as uh, receptors – could be found between bats and humans. So a, a virus would, might be able to jump from a bat more readily into a human population than, say, from a mouse or a, a different type of carnivore or something like that. So that, that's one. Um, the second is bats have some characteristics and some behaviors and some lifestyle things that contribute, what I think would, would contribute to the, their ability to transmit viruses. Uh, some of those things include hundreds of species that... Uh, live close together, so there's the opportunity for uh, passing viruses between them. Um, they're distributed worldwide, found on every continent except for Antarctica. Um, they have long lifespans, 35 years in some cases, so they could shed persistent viral fe- infections. Uh, colonial habitat, where they're, you know you have large numbers of bats living very close together, um, and you have the opportunity there for not only viruses to spread, but ectoparasites carrying viruses to spread from bats to bats. And I think an interesting idea is the fact that you might have cross-continental migratory range uh, transportation of viruses. For example, uh, Brazilian free-tailed bats um, in the southeast United States actually can tr- to migrate up to 800 miles south. And that almost brings you into the hot spot of northern South America. And if you have other b- bats that are migrating, you might have overlapping migration patterns where viruses can spread from one bat to the other and be transported long distances and maybe a, a way of trafficking viruses from South to North America. Mm. So some interesting uh, ideas and things that we're interested in pursuing and, and understanding in more detail. Have you, um, have you tried culturing any of these viruses on available cell lines? Um, well, I don't have permission to do so. I didn't have permission ah. to do so at that time, but I now have a, a little room set up where it's, it's, it's BSL-2+, plus, so anybody that enters the room has to have the, the rabies vaccine, so that allows me the opportunity to, to pursue some of those things. And I definitely, I definitely want to see if we can pull out some of the viruses. I, think that's, I really think that's, you know, virus discovery is very cool, and I love it, but really what's going to be important for the virology community is having viruses that we can work with, reagents that we can work with, study, and begin to understand how they traffic between different species. Right. Yeah, it's always a little hard to uh, to believe in a virus that only shows up in a database. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So for that study, you go back to uh, your original samples and see if you can grow them on whatever cell lines you got around. Is that the idea? Yep. Okay. Well, you could construct the whole genome from the sequence, right? <laughs> yep. And- and that's that's the second thing is to uh, to synthetically re- reconstruct the virus, which we've done with the 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 bat SARS like coronavirus. Um, basically, you build a molecular clone, uh, divide the genome into fragments that can be grown in plasmids, um, digest, ligate them together, and transfect them into cells, and recapitulate the virus that way. So, either way, I mean. Obviously, if if the virus is in the fecal sample and you can filter it and put it on cells and it grows, that's a lot easier than having to go through the process of synthetically designing it. Yeah. I guess an important question is whether the viruses are actually infecting the bat as opposed to being passed through them, right? And maybe right. you could get at that by seeing if the bats have antibodies to these viruses. Yeah, right? yeah that's – yep. It's, but you don't have blood, is that right, or do you? We don't at this time, but we're in the process of getting approval to to take blood samples as well. This year too, we're also sampling in a different area. So we have uh, one of Ed has Ed has a postdoc who's sampling in parks in the Northeast United States in, in areas that have been decimated by white nose syndrome, 
And so he's uh, collecting bat samples from a variety of different species uh, all across the the, the, the uh, what's the northeast United States area. So we're seeing different. We're going to get some different species. And we're also going to be com- be able to compare different subspecies. For example, uh, the big brown bat has a number of different subspecies, some of which live in the northern United States and some in the southern. So we should be able to compare different viral populations in bats based on where they live and uh, compare them as well. So that that'll be interesting. It might also be interesting uh, once you get the DNA work uh, working um, to see if there are family relationships um, like viruses being handed down vertically. Yeah. Because yeah. I know there's there's been a lot of work recently with um, the intestinal flora and, and deep sequencing on that. And one of the things that you see is that certain um, species seem to crop up repeatedly in families. Yeah. That's interesting. Um that reminds me of another uh, interesting virus that we found. Um, and it, so we're seeing a lot of bacteriophage as well, as you can imagine. But one of the ones that – the cool thing about this, and this TWIF sort of helps with this because, you know, I, I see these cool viruses and I have no idea what they are. And, you know, you guys have covered some of them on TWIV, which has been great. It's allowed me to get educated. But So this one in particular was a bacteriophage that infects the sweet pea aphid. And uh, I had no idea what I was about to discover when I began, you know, search research into what this phage actually does. But it, but it's a very cool story. So th- th- this particular aphid is subject to being parasitized by a parasiti- parasitic wasp that will inject its larva into the aphid, and the aphid is of course destroyed as the larva develops into the into the wasp. But if the aphid happens to be infected with Hamiltonella defensa, which is a bacterium, it also happens to be infected with this phage, apsiphage. The two of them together, if they have the right combination of toxins, can provide a rudimentary immune system that repels the parasitic wasp hmm. and protects the aphid. And there's eight of these known bacteriophage, well, seven of these known bacteriophage, and we have one almost full-length sequence of uh, APC number eight. Which is interesting. You know, so we're in the process now of uh, trying to determine which toxins it has, and what you know, trying to de- to, de- to decide you know if it may have been in an aphid that was protected from being parasitized by a parasitic wasp. Mm, it's a very fascinating story. And then you begin to wonder. Okay, so now you have four players there. You've got the bacteria. You've got the bacteriophage. You've got the aphid. You've got the wasp. And now you have the bat that might be dropping this rudimentary immune system around the environment in ways that. I mean, it's just totally fascinating. Very cool. You know, yeah. you have to basically figure out what you want to focus on because there's too yeah. much. Yeah, I, too that much. that is my problem. I tell you. <laughs> Yes, you you really cannot much. do a depth first search on this, <laughs> right? <laughs> right. And which is cool because you know, and there's so many areas well, I could relate to Eric Delbert when he was talking about looking for collaborators because there's so many areas where it would be just cool to say, "Are you interested in this? I'll give you all the information that I have, and you can run with it. Let me know what you need." Well, and, that's great. I think if you did that, it would be nice as opposed to keeping everything. You know, the other idea I had too was after lif- listening to Fireside Chat with. Um, the, the phage people from Pittsburgh is that it might be kind of cool to get a team of undergraduates that are interested in data mining and, and getting them into the process of right. assembling viral genomes. That might be a very cool thing to do, and I think they would enjoy that as well. Yeah. Now, for the mining itself is easy, right? You just It's just computer work, and well, they like, might be excited, but you can't expose them to the bats. That's the problem, right? Right, right. It's too dangerous. That's why the phage is a beautiful system, because it's safe. right. Right. Well, and they could help with the eyeball time, as Eric Delward called it. Yep, eyeball <laughs> time. That's right. So, what what are you going to do? What's your next year of work? Um, so, we've got more bat sampling going on. We're interested. So, I'm really interested in looking at a localized ecology. So, we have a beautiful system here with the tunnel. We have seven to ten different bat species. We have the insects that they're eating. We have other rodents and. Uh, uh, animals that enter the tunnel. We have standing water in the tunnel. So I'm interested in learning about how viruses traffic between different species in this localized environment. So we want to expand and look at some of the viruses in the insects, some of the viruses that might be in the standing water, some of the viruses that might be in the rodents, and compare them to the viruses that we're seeing in bats to see if there's a relationship and if there might be trafficking between uh, the different species that live in this microenvironment. That's very cool. I love it. 
Yeah, it's really, I, I, I feel like the luckiest guy in the world. I can't wait to get to work in the morning. It's it's a very fascinating project. So. Right. <laughs> I can imagine at some point you're going to want to have your own group and do this, right? Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. You can do whatever you want. That's great. Yep. Are you talking at ASV about this? Yep. Looking forward to that. That'll be cool. Rich and I will be in the audience, right? We will. Front Sounds row. Good. <laughs> Sounds good. Are you doing a live twiv there? We are, yeah. Good. Well, I'll be sure to be there, too. It's Rich, myself, Carla Kierkegaard, and Marilyn Rusink. Right. The four of us. Dixon can't make it, unfortunately. And but, I can't make it. And, now, will uh, he be Alan. in the state but just fishing instead of attending the conference? No, he's uh, come back home as of today, I believe. Uh, oh, okay. So he had been out there on his own fishing trip, and he was going to go back next weekend, but then uh, decided that he couldn't afford it, or <laughs> I don't remember the reason, but he's not going to be able to go. Someday when Twiv makes money, we'll be able to do uh, live Twivs everywhere, and we'll pay for everyone. But until right, that day someday comes, way in the future. <laughs> hey, who <laughs> knows? It might money. be five years, you know. <laughs> Depends. If I get a, a grant for it, uh, who knows? But that's a topic for another another time. Well, that's great. Do you guys want to do a couple of uh, virus stories before we move on? Would that sure. be? That that pick, I, sure. I picked one for Rich and one for for, <laughs> for Eric. <laughs> something that you guys would like. And the first one is vaccine virus infection after sexual contact with a military smallpox vaccine. And this is something that came up in Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report. Which is always a good read. Yeah, yeah. I like, I really, it, they are a good read. They're really interesting because they're really well written. And they got the case report and the epidemiology. And then they got the editorial note, which is great, where the editors, everything is very, very uh, sort of cut and dry and very clinical up until then. And the editors come on and say, okay, gang, here's what you did wrong. <laughs> here's how you got to change this. Did we talk about a similar case before, Rich? Uh, I don't think so. There have been similar cases around. Well, uh, we've talked about... Um, we talked, we've talked about a couple of cases where a military vaccinee uh, was the index case in an accidental, uh, well, we've talked about two. There was one where a military vaccinee transferred uh, the virus to a child that had eczema. Right. And both the child and the mother uh, got very ill. And there was another where there was uh, military person personnel who was vaccinated, and um, it was discovered subsequently that they had uh, leukemia. Right. So they were immunosuppressed, immunosuppressed right. and uh, it caused a progressive disease in that person. But we yeah. haven't talked about, although there have been other cases like this, we haven't talked about yeah. any of So what's the rundown, Rich? So uh, the case report uh, has a, 20, a patient in her 20s visiting an urgent care clinic reporting a two-day history of painful ring-shaped vaginal swellings. The physical exam reveals a single raised circular lesion with central ulceration on the right uh, labia majora. And she reports that her boyfriend was a military service member who was uh, recently was vaccinated for smallpox, and she expressed concern that the lesions might be related to this exposure. So this is great. She is handing this case to the healthcare worker on a platter. <laughs> the healthcare provider did not make a diagnosis, but cultured for gonorrhea, chlamydia, herpes, and treated with uh, a bunch of uh, antibiotics um, and uh, told her to follow up with her primary care physician in the next few days. Well, she didn't wait for it. Well, I guess she, five days later, she, she went to a different clinic. <laughs> Because of increased pain at the site of the lesion, and these guys got on top of it, and within two days, had sent material out to both a local lab and to the CDC uh, with a suspicion of uh, uh, vaccinia virus, and it came back positive for vaccinia virus. By this time, it had spread to inside her vagina, so this is, I'm sure, a very uncomfortable situation. Um, so you get down to the epidemiologic uh, uh, investigation, it becomes a little clearer. The patient's boyfriend received a smallpox vaccination on February 15th, 
Um, on February 20th, he removed the van, uh, bandage covering his vaccination site the same day the couple had unprotected sexual intercourse preceded by digital vaginal, vaginal contact. Four days later, um, the first lesion appeared uh, on the patient's right labia majora. So this is classic accidental vaccination, which is uh, one of the, uh, it is probably the most common um, side effect or negative outcome of uh, vaccination where somebody, the vaccination itself has live virus in it. And uh, if you are instructed properly when you're vaccinated, you're told to keep that thing covered um, from the time of the vaccination until when the scab falls off, which can be as long as two weeks um, because there is live virus in there. And you're told that if in fact you touch it or anything that uh, uh, touches it, you're supposed to wash your hands carefully and that kind of stuff. Uh, so this guy did not follow the instructions. He removed the bandage five days after he was vaccinated. So at that point, he probably has a blistering lesion on his arm that is uh, full of virus. And um, it's really easy to spread the stuff from there to other sites. Um, and they say that during uh, during the incubation period, the risk of inadvertent inoculation to another site uh, or another person is uh, high. The most frequently reported sites are for unintentional transfer are face, nose, mouth, lips, genitalia, anus, and eye. The virus likes to grow in uh, or infect in uh, open wounds uh, and mucous membranes. So female genitalia are uh, a prime site for accidental vaccination. So I think there's several interesting things about this. First of all, it's interesting that the military vaccinates for smallpox. Mm -hmm. um, they did that for a long time, then they quit for a long time. Uh, and then after 9-11, uh, they started doing it again. Uh, second, I think it's interesting that the first physician who saw the patient blew it. And they point that out here. They say the first physician who saw the patient on February 26th only pursued laboratory testing for common sexually transmitted infections, although the patient stated that she'd had contact with a smallpox vaccine. The other interesting thing is that the, the uh, vaccine himself did not take good care of this thing. And whether that's because he was just being careless or where he was uh, improperly uh, instructed um, is unknown. And I think lastly, uh, it occurred to me that uh, None of this, well, I mean, you can question whether you need to smallpox vaccinate, they give smallpox vaccinations to the military. Obviously, it's a biodefense issue or a biological warfare issue. Um, but I wonder when they're going to start using MVA for this. We've talked about MVA before, which is the attenuated uh, strain of uh, vaccinia virus that uh, doesn't have this problem because you don't, uh, it's administered as an injection because it is so attenuated and it really doesn't replicate at all. So the risk of uh, accidental transfer is is low. Who's making MVA? Do you know? That's, um, Nordic. we talked about, yeah, um, Bavarian Nordic. Okay. Right. They've got the big contract from the uh, U.S. government to uh, make and stockpile all this stuff. But I don't know what the status is of uh, making that available for uh, this type of thing. Seems with the number of military personnel we have that it uh, probably would make sense to switch over, make, right? It would make a lot of sense. I can't believe that isn't uh, under discussion at this point, at least. Because uh, okay. this could be more serious, especially if the recipient were immunocompromised in some way. Ah, yes. So that's important. There's another part of this. Uh, part of the epidemiology uh, was to look at uh, possible other contacts. And the woman lived with uh, three other people, I think, two of whom had a normal health status, but one of whom uh, was someone who had a kidney transplant in 2001 and so is uh, always uh, taking immunosuppressive drugs. And so that's, uh, there's a possibility there that that person could, uh, well, that person would be more susceptible to uh, spread of this from uh, the original infection. And uh, but everything turned out okay. Uh, nobody else got infected. Uh, they 
checked out all the healthcare mm-hmm. workers. Everybody had taken proper precautions uh, from the get-go, uh, and so there was uh, no further spread. And usually, this is this is the outcome. It's rarely that this uh, spreads any further. And usually, in the individual who is affected uh, in, the, in in the first instance, uh, it just uh, resolves in a normally healthy individual. It just uh, resolve on its own, and everything's fine. There's no sequelae. Plus. She's immune to smallpox, so yeah. that's a bonus. I guess the bottom line is that not only should we switch vaccines, but until we do, the person who gives the immunization needs to really emphasize not to do this. Right. Right. Uh, yeah, uh, just emphasize how to how to take care of it and interview properly to find out whether there's any um, uh, any people in the uh, person's uh, normal contacts who would be who have eczema or are immunosuppressed, and uh, if so, yeah. either don't vaccinate or take uh, special precautions. All that all that stuff is important. And an important thing about the MMWR report here, that's part of the editorial, is to alert clinicians that you know when somebody comes in and tells you this story, wake up, yeah, because right? yeah. this is yep. a possibility. Yeah, there's something interesting in the story that I have a question about. Um, so it said at one point they took a swab and they placed the of the lesion. They took the swab, they placed it in universal transport media and took it to the lab, but that that isn't doesn't work well for pox viruses for Virginia. So then they had to go back and get a swab and put it in a dry tube and take it right. to the lab. I'm wondering why that is. Do you have any well, idea? Well, that that puzzled me as well. I mean, there must be uh, there must be uh, tests that say that um, it actually survives better. Uh, on a dry swab than uh, uh, in fluid, but it doesn't. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me, based on what I know about the virus. The virus is tough under any circumstances, uh. um, and so uh, I don't see any reason, uh, except for the fact that I suppose it's more dilute or something like that in the viral transport media. I don't see why it should necessarily be much better. I'll bet you, if they went back to that viral transport media, they'd be able to get what they wanted out of yeah, it. Yeah, I would think so. I was, I was curious because we—that's what we transport our bat samples into is universal transport. Oh, okay, so that's uh, that's an interesting little uh, bitlet uh, bitlet for you. But I'd have to I'd have to look into that further because I'm I I would really be surprised if it didn't survive in the normal uh, viral uh, transport media. But there must have been some study some time ago that said that the dry swab is uh, is the better way to do it. Okay, and so yeah. that's what they do. Hmm. I notice here in the at the end they uh, talk about a military vaccine agency, Milvax, which right. has, has a I website, and it looks like it's a website just for the military, all about all the vaccines that they're likely to get. They get a lot of them. Yeah, yeah. It looks great. I think it's a good informational site, which I had not seen before. Uh, they have uh, right on the front page the rotavirus vaccine issues that we've talked about, child immunizations, Department of Department of Defense vaccine price list. Wow! If you want to see how much the DoD pays for vaccines, if they pay five hundred bucks for a hammer, how much do they <laughs> pay for a vaccine? That should be ten bucks. That's pretty cool. Well, um, in connection with this story, I thought I would mention um, what I found last week. I went on a Circle Line tour. I talked about this with you, Alan, last week on Twitter. Yes. And uh, as part of the tour, going up the East River in New York. The guide said, and now we're passing on the right the smallpox hospital. So I said, what is this? I took a couple of photos, which I've posted, and it turns out on the south end of Roosevelt Island, which is in the East River of New York, there is a crumbling ruin of what used to be the smallpox hospital, built in 1856, when there was still smallpox in New York City. And apparently, despite having a vaccine, there were still a lot of immigrants coming into the city at the time with smallpox, and they used to send them out to this hospital on the island. So New I, York City has a long history of um, quarantining people on its outlying islands. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting. The, um, in fact, another virological note right at the mouth of New York Harbor, right off Staten Island, there are um, two artificial islands, Hoffman and Swinburne Islands. And those were um, quarantine facilities for immigrants who came into Ellis Island with a variety of infections. And <clears throat> at one point, uh, they also quarantined um, the victims of a major yellow fever epidemic. Interesting. There. Didn't know that. Yep. Well, this is a cool-looking structure. I took a couple of pictures and, and looked it up, and so there you have it. Closed down uh, 
in the 50s, and now it's fallen apart. But uh, interesting historical incident and uh, having to do with smallpox, of course. Rich, when did we start immunizing against smallpox? Do you know? So uh, Jenner was 1796. Right. uh, And smallpox was just such a huge problem that his vaccination technique caught on really quickly. And it was all over the place uh, by the early 19th century. Matter of fact, there was this thing called the Balmas edition where the Spanish crown sent out a, uh, an expedition to transport vaccine to all the Spanish colonies in 1803. But in the early 1800s, there were just sort of ad hoc uh, vaccination programs. I did not even really programs here. The Congress passed a vaccine act in So it was sort of a viral vaccination campaign. It's very good. <laughs> the U.S. Congress passed a vaccine act in 1813 uh, to make sure that uh, everybody got a smallpox vaccination. And interestingly, that was repealed in 1822 uh, because um, there was an outbreak of smallpox in North Carolina traced to a contaminated vaccine provided by a federal agent who was supposed to preserve and distribute distribute genuine vaccine. Shades of, you know, this is early vaccine problems, right? Uh, and they, so, the, uh, so the Congress decided to return the authority for this back to the states so that uh, they could mm. uh, do it themselves. Um, so as early as 1843... Uh, Massachusetts was the first state to require smallpox vaccination. Uh, Between 1843 and 1855, there was a whole bunch of other uh, state-required smallpox vaccination programs. So it starts in the early 1800s. It gains really uh, sort of uh, uh, legislative traction as early as 1813, and the states start uh, requiring vaccination uh, in the 1840s. And this hospital was built, what, 1856? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then it, by uh, the late 1800s, vac- uh, smallpox was by and large eliminated from uh, the U.S. So it was, we haven't had, we haven't had endemic smallpox mm. since the since the early 20th century but there was a uh, of course smallpox everywhere else in the world so we had to continue vaccination in particular for travelers and stuff no just continue vaccination in general to um, protect ourselves from uh, importation yeah well according to this uh, looking at the Wikipedia entry for it and it closed in 1875 became a training center and then later on fell apart, was closed completely. Now if you, uh, I think it's lit at night, so if you're on the east side of New York, you can see it. In the, it's in about the 50s. And, of course, if you take a circle line around Manhattan, make sure you look at it, take a photo. It's interesting that that is, um, you know, regarded as such an historic landmark. They, yeah. I watched a little, you posted a little video or something, or I... Or maybe I saw that link yeah, from there, there is a link, yeah, yeah. Um, that, you know, there's a lot of people who are really taking a very strong interest in that building. Yeah, yeah it's, the, it's apparently New York's only landmarked ruin. They're trying to raise money to uh, refurbish it, I guess, so people can see it. I don't yeah. know what the status of that is, because if you look at the pictures I took, there seems to be some construction going on, but um, it's clearly not yet open to the public. Right, so. the wiki entry on it says that they um, they stabilized it. Yeah, so it doesn't fall down anymore. So it right? doesn't fall down anymore, but uh, it's kind of unclear when they would get the money yeah. to actually rebuild something like that, or if ever. Yeah, I'd, <clears throat> I would doubt it, but it's an interesting historical side note in virology, so I thought you guys would like that. I'm going to have to take the uh, circle tour next time I'm in Yeah, it was the first time yeah. I ever took it. It was good. That's what I was thinking, too. Yeah, if you come here, do it, because I've been here for my whole life, and I never took it, so I went, and I really liked it, because the guy who narrates it was fabulous, and you, you learn stuff you didn't know about, and uh, including the smallpox hospital. But don't bother climbing up to the top of the Statue of Liberty. No. I did that with a friend who was visiting New York when I lived there, and he insisted on doing the tourist thing, and it's... Uh, it's a long it? hike up the steps for three hours waiting to get into this little tiny area where you look out from the crown and get an obstructed view of part of the harbor. So 
Okay. <laughs> really well, not worth not worth it. You you could take the boat, go out, visit the island, and then come back. Yeah. Well, the circle line goes past it. It's quite nice. Probably and a much goes, better deal. It's really good. Our last story is for Eric, a flavy virus from bats in Bangladesh. I don't know if you'd seen this story, Eric. Yeah, I did. I saw it when it came out on ProMed Mail. This is from uh, Ian Lipkin's lab. Mm-hmm. Basically, from Bangla- these guys are sampling a, uh, a bat colony in Bangladesh. These are bats that eat fruits. They're per- frugivorous. Frugivorous, which is a new word for me. Pteropus giganteus, big bats. And um, they found a uh, flavy virus, which we'll talk about in a moment. But these bats, uh, I thought you would be interested. They, uh, they have a colony of 1,800 bats, so they sampled 98 of them. Mm-hmm. They got serum, uh, they got saliva from a throat uh, swab, urine. Um, so they did a little bit more than you guys, I guess, right? They got serum. Which right. you haven't gotten. These are big animals, right? Right, right. These are they are quite large. I was looking at some photos uh, online. They're big. I don't. I wouldn't want to catch them. I don't know if you would either, Eric. No, I don't think so. the ones that we catch are smaller than a mouse, so they're easy to handle. These would probably be <laughs> a handful. They, uh, <laughs> they um they let them go. They didn't hurt them, of course, but um, they marked them with a with a microchip. It's implanted subcutaneously yeah, that. in the back. Yeah, Isn't that cool? So you can tell exactly where they are, I guess, because they're always emitting a signal, right? Or maybe you just scan it when you catch them again. I'm not sure. Right. But anyway, then they do sequencing of the material just like you did, and they found a flavy virus, which is related and possibly ancestral to uh, a, a group of viruses um, from humans and other animals called GB viruses. And these are very interesting viruses, GB, sometimes called hepatitis G virus, the original um, isolate from a surgeon in 1966 whose name was G. Barker. So GB virus is from his name. He had hepatitis, and they they identified this virus from him. And uh, many years later, other isolates were obtained. So they have, and they were called GBA, GBV, GBVB and GBV-C. And so this bat virus is related to these. So they're calling it GBVD, and it's possibly ancestral. So maybe the GB virus of people came from bats uh, some time ago. Maybe it's a zoonosis. Apparently, many people are infected with uh, these GB viruses. So they're flavy viruses. They're sort of like hepatitis C virus, but distinct enough in their sequence to be separately classified. They're enveloped with a positive strand RNA. About, um, I think, 1% to 2% of the population seems to be seropositive for GBVC. Not clear if it causes hepatitis or not. And in fact, there, in an article I found, they're saying it's not clear it should be called hepatitis G virus because we're not sure if it, in fact, causes serious hepatitis. But uh, So this is an uh, interesting virus from a bat that looks like these HGV or hepatitis G viruses. What do you think about that, Eric? Yeah, it was very cool. I, I liked this study a lot. In fact, I, as soon as I saw it come out, I checked all my databases to see if any of our reads matched to the GBV viruses and didn't get any hits. So Not surprising, right? No, right. Exactly. Different species, different part of the world. Yeah. Yep. Well, Bangladesh is uh, a tough place to be looking for stuff. I mean, there are a lot of bats and a lot of in, in zootic diseases there. And as they say, it's a great place to look for, look for new viruses because a lot of people, a lot of animals, you know, and so that's why they're doing this. But uh, I wouldn't want to be going over there to do this. No, it's, I think it's considered a hot spot as far as places where diseases emerge into human population. So yep. it'd be a good place to go catch a disease. Yeah, but, I, I think uh, you have the right idea staying in Maryland. <laughs> a little safer. Yep. Uh, what, uh, there were some interesting corollaries, though, with this study that I thought were just were interesting and I could relate to. One is the fact that they had two sequence reads, and they were 50% identical at the amino acid level. And mm-hmm. when they did the search at the nucleotide level, it came back as nothing. And that, that is what's happening with a lot of our viruses as well. If you do a nucleotide search in the non-redundant database, it comes back as nothing. Wow. If you do a BLAST-X search where you translate it into a nucle- or an amino acid sequence and, and then blast it against the protein database, then you get 50 to 60% identity to something 
uh, related. So it's obvious that these are ancestral, they're ancient, they're probably using different codon uh, frequencies, and so they're mm. very interesting. That is but, neat. But, yeah, and then they use uh, they they found two sequence reads, and then they went in with uh, doing PCR to pull out and fill in the gaps. So very much very similar to what we're trying to do. Neat. Yeah. And so all right, there you go, a flavivirus from Bangladeshi bats. And, actually, I had a a, a sure. question about this. You mentioned Eric that they had two sequence reads. That's all they got to start with, right? Right. Was two separate short reads, like two hundred and fifty nucleotides or something. Right. Two hundred thirty eight. That told them that something was there, and then what do you do? You go back and you use that as uh, starting material to design primers and see if you can amplify out the whole thing, huh? Right. Yeah, use that and then do a primer walking strategy where you go after the whole genome. So That's sometimes these hits are just really just a nick, right? You just exactly. Yeah. And you have to go back and say, well, okay, that's interesting, and see if you can put something together. Right. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, and they were able to, from two hits, to get a full 9,900 nucleotide genome here. That's a good point. It's not always so obvious, yeah, that what you're getting is anything until you work on it. Yeah. It very much becomes like looking for a needle in a haystack because, you know, you've got a two hits probably out of, human, probably in the neighborhood of 500,000 to a million reads. So you've got to get to the point where you recognize that those two hits are interesting and then go in and try to fill out, fill in the gaps and see if, you got a genome there if it's just some some match to some something that's a bad age yeah. or what whatever. Let's move on to a couple of emails here. But before we do, I just want to mention our last Drobo winner. Uh, we had announced a contest to get 50% off a Drobo or Drobo FS at drobostore.com. And the winner is Timothy, who we'd like to congratulate and thanks for participating. Uh, Timothy actually has an email which will be coming up in a couple of weeks. And again, we thank Drobo for Jada Robotics for sponsoring 24 episodes of TWIV. Our first email is from Eric himself, which I thought I'd read part of because it's quite illuminating. Hi, Vincent. After 86 episodes of TWIV, I'm still loving every minute of the podcast, and I'm constantly impressed with how much I learned. For example... I've been mentoring an undergraduate student in the lab, and we've had a rough two-week stretch where none of her experiments have worked. I was racking my brain trying to come up with some things that would help boost her confidence. On my way to the lab on Thursday morning, I listened to you and Rich and Dr. Kiki, and Rich described how a good mentor guides the student in a direction that will allow them to succeed. I took that approach with her that morning, and we had a great discussion about the project. What additional experiments she could try and I was able to assure her that it was not her skills that were lacking. On Friday, she had two great successes that really boosted her confidence, and I felt like a good mentor. Thank you, Twiv. Cool. Yeah, that was a great, I was really, um, she came in, really what she was doing is trying to fill in the coronavirus, the gaps in the coronavirus, and she had done, I don't know, 20 PCR reactions, and none of them had worked, and she was beginning to feel like she was, completely incompetent and I kept trying to explain you know this is the way science works you have a bunch of failures and then you have a success and it's really cool but yeah it was it was so you know I was getting sort of stressed out like I really want her to succeed how can I help her succeed and then I heard you guys discuss that and it was just hmm. you know, great well, I'm glad uh, I'm glad we could help yeah it was great <laughs> so we can say when you help people it's great Good advice, and then when the science works on top of it, then that yeah. helps too. So part of, part of the training, as you know, is to feel like you're incompetent. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've been meaning to uh, bring this up, uh, you know, at some point. You know, I went through uh, many years wondering, is it just me, <laughs> or or does everybody have this failure rate? You know, and right. It's everybody. It's not just you. It's a very you know you have to have, you have to have a mentality that can endure like a seventy-five to ninety percent failure rate and still want to go forward because the stuff's just hard. See, this is if, why I if, left the lab. <laughs> <laughs> if it works all the time, then you're probably not really doing science. You know. Uh, good point. Uh, yeah, there's a lower failure rate in writing, right, uh, Alan? Uh, usually, yes. But I guess you knew you could write. That's the important thing, right? Right, right. And so you got over that part. But uh, in, in science, you're always presented with new situations, and you have many opportunities for failing. But uh, if you keep 
trying and change things, you'll get past it. It's important. Yep. Anyway, thanks for your email, Eric. You bet. Thanks for the program. I'm enjoying it very much. Glad glad you are still. David writes, Twiv gang, several emails you've received have addressed the question, can computer viruses mutate? My take on this question is a qualified yes, but in a different way than biological viruses. If I remember correctly, one of the emails you received answered this question as no, because randomly changing bits of a computer program almost invariably results in a broken program. I can vouch that this is true. I work in a group that designs computer chips, and any single bit change will cause the mutated program to go out into the weeds. However, mutations in biological systems, as well as those that computer viruses undergo, happen at a different level. By my way of thinking, changing a single bit in a computer program would be like changing a single atom in a biological compound. If you replace a carbon with a gold atom in adenine, what you'll probably end up with is an expensive non-functional molecule. Instead, mutations in DNA and RNA seem to happen at the molecular level, for example, where an adenine gets replaced by a guanine in the case of single nucleotide polymorphisms. Other mutations, such as copy number variations, occur at the level of a large collection of molecules. The point is that biological mutations occur at a higher level of organization than bits. This greatly increases the probability that the resulting mutants are viable and sometimes fitter than the original. For computer viruses, I'm unaware of any comparable higher level of mutation inherent in computers. I'm not exactly sure how accurate computer-based copying is, but I'll hazard a guess that it is more accurate than biological copying. Errors in computer copying that I've typically encountered have been due to equipment failure. Q Drobo promotion here. (laughs) Because of this, when computer viruses change, it is because the computer virus itself purposely inserts variation into its offspring as they are created. One way antivirus programs detect viruses is to look for virus signatures, sequences of bits and viruses that are characteristic of a virus or family of viruses. To evade detection, one tactic newer viruses use is to modify, quote, mutate, unquote, their children to be unrecognizable to the antivirus software. The viral code is modified at a higher level of organization than bits, such as reordering instructions analogous to SNPs, perhaps. In this way, some computer viruses do change, mutate, if you will, but they self-mutate rather than let nature do the mutating. For some more background, he gives us a link to this to an article on uh, Wikipedia about computer viruses. The Tierra program mentioned in one episode mutates at both the bit level and a higher level of organization, swapping segments of code. The Tierra virtual environment does the mutating in this case. This does beg one question. Are there any biological entities that you are aware of that actively self-mutate? Keep up the good work. I listen to several podcasts, and Twiv and Twip are among the few that I make sure I have time and concentration to really listen to. I get a lot out of these podcasts. P.S. I guess the moral of the story is don't mutate the bits, mutate the organization. I think all biological entities actively self-mutate. Yeah, yeah. I would agree. Yeah, it's an yeah. inherent characteristic of life, and, and you could even argue that the reason we don't have higher fidelity polymerases is quite possibly that they would not be adaptive. Right. Yeah, exactly. And there are some organisms like uh, uh, we've discussed before, I think even uh, you know, RNA viruses mutate faster than DNA viruses, and that has uh, consequences for how fast they evolve and uh, right. what they look like. I think the first point that he makes, though, is quite good, which is that the you have to look at the level at which the mutation is taking place, um, that these are not atomic changes in organisms, just as they wouldn't be bit changes in, um, in a stealthy computer virus. Um, so what, what you're seeing in the evolutionary process is things like rearrangements or deletions or additions of, of bases or large segments of DNA, not individual atomic changes. Yeah, I, I like his point. I think it's a good uh, way of comparing and contrasting right. the two. It's very nice. Uh, we're getting a lot of feedback from these sort of computer types out there, uh, uh, suggesting that there's a lot more in common with uh, uh, viruses and mutation in computers than we might have thought previously, yeah. it seems to me. And there are even, um, I'm not a, a complete expert in this, but there are even computer languages that I gather make this fairly straightforward. Um where the code can rewrite the code. I will have to lay this one on my son, uh, uh, who is uh, heavy into chips 
and operating system. Yeah, do that. See cool. what he says. That would, that would be great. I'm sure so, he doesn't. He doesn't listen to Twiv, right? No, I try. You know, but he's got <laughs> other things on his mind. Uh, so I guess if my friend is able to upload his brain in 50 years, this is going to be a new type of virus to worry about. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you are absolutely right. Sure. Anytime you convert to digital and uh, store somewhere, you're going to have that problem. Sure. Yet you're going to have viruses. Better upload his brain on a Drobo. That, right. They're back it up. <laughs> sure I actually, up. I'd like to be able to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Your brain? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Back it up so I can recall what I... Forgot, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Mutated. All right, let's 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 do a couple of science picks of the week, and uh, we'll start with you, Eric. Okay. Um, my pick is a video. Uh, when I'm not doing virology, my second favorite topic is evolution, and I just absolutely love this guy. His name is Sean Carroll. He's an evolutionary biologist, I think, at the University of Wisconsin. And in the last couple of years, he's been doing a lot of talks in celebration of Darwin's uh, 200th anniversary of his uh birth and 150th anniversary of the book um i've lost the book the <laughs> on the origin of species um but anyway so his talk is dedicated to the darwin year but it's a great story about using genes and evolution uh, in context of living organisms so he talks about the the fish that have uh, mutated the hemoglobin gene from red blood cells to Antifreeze. He talks about the mice that have evolved to their uh, to adapt to their environment to be different colors so that they can avoid being eaten by hawks. And it's just a fascinating story. So I've got a link here on the page. Uh, hopefully you'll be able to put that on the website. Uh, one of Sean Carroll's talks on evolutionary biology. Yeah, I will. I uh, I see he's got a whole bunch of them here. Yeah, that's yeah. great. Yep. Yeah, these are good stuff. Good. Great. Thanks very much. Uh, Rich, what have you got? Uh, well, as I said, I think uh, we mentioned this informally some time ago when we were talking about uh, planet Earth, but I want to formalize it as a pick, the uh, documentary movie March of the Penguins, uh, which I think you know anybody interested in sort of wildlife biology would be fascinated with this film. This is uh, basically it's the life cycle of uh, the Antarctic uh, uh, penguins, which is you know an environment that, boy, I wouldn't want to deal with. And um, how they take care of their young, how they take care of the eggs, et cetera. And it's just a fascinating story. It's a very well-made documentary. Great. Yeah, we did talk about this. You were really fascinated with it. Penguins are cool. There's no doubt about it. Yeah. The question is, what viruses do they have? Yeah. Uh. I don't know if anyone's <laughs> looked at that, but it would be interesting, right? Yeah. I mean, they're isolated down there. They don't interact with outside of the area. So what viruses do they have? They must have unique populations. Probably some fish viruses in the intestines. I'll bet. Mm -hmm. You bet. Yep. And Alan, what have you got for us? Uh, my pick this week is really sort of a productivity thing, but it would certainly apply in science. Um, and that's a standing height desk. And I've given a link describing the basic concept. I, I did this a, a few weeks ago, rearranged the office, and I jacked up my desk so that I'm standing up when I work. Uh, and I have a standing height stool to go with it. So it, it's really a lot like a, a lab bench. Hmm. Uh, so you stand hmm. up all the time when you're writing or working? I stand up. Sometimes I sit down on this, uh, the stool that I have. Um, but for the most part I stand. Um, and it is really a dramatic improvement. I think, um, it's, you know, you don't think of doing this because if you stand up at a regular desk, your keyboard would be down around your knees. Hmm. Um, but if you have the proper height, if it's a little bit higher than a kitchen counter, um, so it's comfortable for handling the keyboard. And of course, you have to elevate your your computer screen and everything. Um, but it's great for uh, you know you can pop in the office and and do something quickly and pop back out again. Um, it makes you more mobile and um, and I think more productive. Hmm. I've heard that too. I've heard that especially if you podcast, you should podcast standing up because. It makes your voice um, have more force, standing oh. versus mm. sitting, right? It makes sense. Are you standing up now, Alan? I am standing up right now. Uh. Well, you're in good company. It says here on the link you said that Donald Rumsfeld, Winston Churchill, Leonardo da Vinci, Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, Napoleon, and William <laughs> Gladstone are all reported to have preferred working while standing. Yes. Mm. I guess I better stand up. That's right. I wouldn't mind trying it, but I don't have a high desk here in... Uh, 
in my office. I'd have to. Yeah, get I was one. I was fortunate in having picked this particular IKEA desk. Um, I think I originally bought it because it was cheap and large, but um, it's designed so that you can you can jack up the height to different levels. I just never really tried it before. Hmm. There's a photo they have on that website of a workplace at Pixar Studios. Right. So you can see this guy uh, standing up working there, and I guess it's adjustable, which is good, because they say you should change, actually. Yeah. And he has a couch there, so he can really just sack out when he wants to. Right. Cool. That's great. I guess nice. that makes you an upstanding scientific journalist. Oh, yes, very that's good. right. I very good. <laughs> wow. My pick comes from Richard, who wrote, I greatly enjoy your program. I went back to TWIV number three and see that you wished for a global map for outbreaks. Please have a look at DengueWatch.org. This is a website that we at the Pediatric Dengue Vaccine Initiative set up a few months ago. All the best and keep up the excellent work. So Richard is working at the uh, Dengue Vaccine Initiative, which is in Korea. And DengueWatch.org is a map of the world showing you where there are outbreaks of dengue. And right now, there are quite a few. If you've been following ProMed Mail, you know that uh, there are quite a few dengue outbreaks all over the place. Uh, here's one in Key West. Yeah. Is it Key West? It's down on the Florida Keys. Yeah, there was. Uh, Key yes, West. it is. Yeah, it's Florida. I think that's one of the first in, in Florida in many years since the 40s, I believe. Um, and whether it spreads, who knows. But uh, that's cool. And in fact, Tw TWIV3 was a long time ago before there was even the Google Health map. But this is dengue specific. It's it's a very interesting uh, map, so check that out. And thanks for sending that, Richard. And that'll do it for another TWIV. You can listen to TWIV many ways on iTunes at the Zoom Marketplace. And if you do that, you should subscribe so you get automatically each new episode. And if you hang out at iTunes, please leave a comment about TWIV. It helps us stay right on the front page of the Medicine Podcast section so more people can see us. You can also listen to TWIV at, with Stitcher Radio, which is a free app for your iPhone, iPod Touch, iPad, BlackBerry, Palm, or Google Android. It streams TWIV to your device. Check that out at bit.ly slash Stitch TWIV. And of course, you can always go to twiv.tv where you can play the episodes or download them. And there we also have an archive of everything as well as show notes. Twiv is part of microbeworld.org, sciencepodcasters.org, and promednetwork.com where you can find other great science content. As always, send us your questions and comments to twiv at twiv.tv. Eric, thanks so much for coming back and telling us about bat viruses. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to seeing you next week at ASV. That'll be great. Yeah, definitely. You can find Eric at Viral Nerd on Twitter.com. It's a great name. Glad you got it. Yeah. Viral Nerd, all one word. <laughs> and Alan Dove is at alandove.com. Thanks again for, for coming back, Alan. Sure. Always a good time. And Rich Condit is at a place which is too long to pronounce, but we'll put a link in the show notes. Good enough. Good to have you back. Great to be here. We'll see you next week. We'll see Alan next week, and we'll have Welkin Johnson to talk about endogenous retroviruses. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. Before we go, titles. I think guano happens. Is guano just, happens. Is really, <laughs> whose was that? Uh, not me. That was a bumper sticker that uh, one of the students that works in Ed's lab has on her car. Nice. Yeah. yeah. You like guano happens? <laughs> oh, yeah. All yes. right. Let's read the others. We had the Batman. Viruses go to bat. The viral batting average. Guano happens. And looking for a needle in a guano stack. <laughs> so everyone likes guano happens. Oh, yeah. Guano yes. happens is just great. So be it. Sounds guano good. happens. Thanks, everybody. All, All right. Bye-bye. Right. See you. Take care.